I'm going to start the lecture at the end of my talk. <laughs> because there's a story that is about home, and I think the, the kids who are back in the back will enjoy it. So I'm just, you're just going to have to, it's going backwards this time. But I, I, we worked with some ideas that I'm going to be sharing, and I'm going to talk a lot about some things that I think we'll all be able to wrap our thought around in support of this precious community and some of the stuff they've been going through. So we'll get into that in a little bit. But I wanted to tell a story about when I really had to find a sense of safety. And my home was out in the country, and we just moved there, and it, it had a penitentiary, a prison, and people would escape sometimes. And so we had this idea, my husband, Craig, you want to say hello? <laughs> he and I traveled together, and he was in the military, and he thought we needed to get a big dog, so we felt kind of secure out in the country. So we got a Great Dane. Anybody here ever have a Great Dane? <laughs> well, Stanley was his name. <laughs> big Harlequin, black and white Great Dane. Uh -huh. I should have named him Craig. Well, I had a husband for that, but he was gone a lot, so that's, so that's why we got Stanley. And it was about a tenth of a mile from our, our driveway up to our, our house, and we didn't have a screen door at the time. And, and so Stanley was, you know, kind of our guard dog, but it was kind of a joke. The kids, in fact, used to hide. They'd get behind an umbrella and go down at the driveway entrance and put, get behind this umbrella, and they'd come sneaking up, and Stanley would look and not know who it was, and he'd bark and hide behind a tree. You know, and we thought, this is really a joke. This is our guard dog. So Stanley, um, and he also, one time we were out in the garden, and he, there was a monarch butterfly came by at about Stanley's height, and he was tall, he was a big dog, and he clomped onto this monarch, and I said, Stanley, no, and he opened his mouth, and the monarch just kept flying on. <laughs> and Stanley loved everybody. Stanley would sit on your lap. If you sat on the sofa, he'd move his bottom over and sit right down with his legs on the ground. And he also talked. He said, Mama. I'd say, Stanley, say Mama. And he'd go, Mama. He talks. And I'd say, Stanley, say, I love you. And he'd go, I love you. And I'm like, oh, wow. This is the greatest dog in the whole world. Well, I'd been thinking a lot about safety. We had a number of kids, and I'll share that in a little bit. And, and one day, Stanley was upstairs, and I was, I, I was downstairs. We have like stairs that go to the front door, and you go downstairs to a downstairs laundry room and some of the bedrooms. And I heard a knock on the door. Now, we didn't, as I said, we didn't have a screen, and it was way remote, and I was all alone. And when I heard that knock, I came up, and there was a man standing there, and he didn't look like a very nice guy. And he had a squirt bottle in his hand, and I could tell he, prob he didn't have a car, so he'd walked all the way up our driveway. And I said, may I help you? And I had a bad feeling. And he said, I've got something for you. And I said, I'm not interested. And he was holding this squirt bottle. And I stepped backwards, and he stepped forward. And he said, it'll only take a minute. And I said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. And I kept ste stepping backwards. And I was thinking, where's Stanley? <laughs> not a word out of Stanley until the third time the man said, I've got something for you. And I started praying. And the way that I prayed, I'm going to share it. I call it a 4R process. The first thing I did is I said, no, I rejected this thought that this man was coming for something other than good. And then I thought, he's made out of God's qualities, and I was just praying. And he didn't know I was praying because I was just standing there smiling, you know. And then I started really seeing in him that he was good and he knew it. And right when I got the fear was kind of coming and it stopped and it got real quiet, Stanley slowly came walking down the stairs, and I'm standing there, and the man's standing in front of me, and he sat down next to me, and he looked at the man, and his head was about this tall. And the man looked at Stanley, and he looked at me, and he said, whoa, that's a big dog you have there. And I said, he is, isn't he? And he said, well, I better go. So I'm like, yes! So that's your story, kids. I hope you like Stanley. Stanley was a wonderful dog, and you know, the way I got to feeling safe wasn't always so easy. But before I get into that, I want to share that there are restrooms there, and there are restrooms you can get to there, and there's cider and wonderful things, cookies. And the dear, dear folks who called me four days ago to give this lecture, I want to give you a great big hand, thank you, and lots of love for your hearts. Tough. Not easy when you have headlines that say close call or recovering 
you know, some of these things, and we were seeing you on the news, and I'll tell you, you have a lot of love coming toward this precious community. Lots of love. And the interesting thing is when you see all these disasters and the things that people are, are faced with, the thing that comes through is all the kindness. How many wonderful things have been going on in this community? Just driving through and seeing the fi thank you to the firefighters and we love you. So much good is coming out of this experience. Tonight, the goal for me is, and for this community who brought me here, is that we all join together in a kind of powerful renovation, if you will, of thought that really brings to light more love, more affection, and maybe even new ideas that will help those who've been through tough times to feel how loved they are. So it's a, it's a really mental power that we're gonna tap into that has to do with a home within that no one can lose. So I'm gonna talk about safety and security, about comfort, restoration, and healing. So if the boys have had enough and they wanna go into the nursery, they're welcome to get up and go to the nursery if you, if you heard enough about Stanley. Okay, thanks guys. Um, Craig and I have um, a big family. We live in Salem, Oregon, and we're out in the country, and we have six kids, and none have the same two birth parents. So it's a, and they range from 16 to 43, and we have 16 grandkids and two great grandkids. And because of the mix of our family, we've had to really discover what home was all about and find a deep, deep sense of home that will help some of the children we've taken into our home feel that they're just as precious and loved as those of us who've maybe had homes for many, many years and very secure, have very secure lives. Our kids, just to, to tell you a little about them, I, I had a child when I was 17, dropped out of high school at 16, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And then um, we have one birth child. And then from the state of California, we felt like we had a lot of love to share, so we adopted a child, a biracial daughter, who was nine years old when we got her, and she'd had 14 homes, and uh, had had a pretty tough life. And she was working with a psychiatrist, and we became good friends over the year of adoption process. After that year, and the adoption was final, he called me, Dr. Walker, and he said, I've got another child for you. And I'm thinking, great, <laughs> what I don't need is another child. Oh, he said, just meet her. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not going to work. It's, you know, and I do think it was like going to the Humane Society to pick out a puppy or something. <laughs> and it was really tough. So I went to meet Kate. And Kate has, was six, and she'd had 13 homes. And there had been a lot of abuse, and her sense of home was so scattered that she hadn't been able to attach to anybody. So there was a lot of fear and a lot of displacement, things that had happened in her life that made it, well, they told us she probably wouldn't attach. And she bit her nails and an eye crossed, and she was just little, she looked like a little giraffe. She was freckled and blonde and just darling little girl, but very frightened. And so I, t I went to meet this little gal, and I said, okay, I'll take her for an ice cream cone. And Kate and I got an ice cream cone, and. We went to go to the park and we didn't have any money. I didn't, no coins to park at the parking, you know, at the park in the parking meter to put in the meter. And I said, honey, I can't, we can't stop. I don't have any coins. And little Kate, who was living in what we later found out was an abusive foster home, she reached in her pocket and she pulled out and she said, I have a nickel. Yeah. I thought, whoa, this little gal has her own sense of home, I thought. I don't need to worry if I have enough money or it's not coming from me. My job, I realized in that I have a nickel moment, was to find within that precious child her own home that she had within her that nobody could ever take from her. And we began a process that took many years and lots of love and lots of hugs and her own beauty began to just to shone through, shine through this fearful face and it, the eye uncrossed and she quit biting her nails and she just turned into the most kind, warm, loving daughter you could have and she's now married and has three beautiful children and she's actually adopting one, she'll get him in a couple weeks from now. And I couldn't have a more beautiful daughter. Now I could never have done this if I hadn't had some of the ideas I'm gonna share with you that each and every one of us has a home within and we might have a house to put that home in, and we might not. Some of us, I was homeless at one point, and so was the discoverer and founder of Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy, homeless, and 
Some of you might have been, and maybe through this disaster time have seen those who are homeless. But there's a house, a ho I mean houseless, but there's a home within that can be discovered and cherished that will actually give us a sense of warmth and tenderness and security that will come forth in a practical, natural way. And, and it'll, it'll manifest itself in a way that looks just right for each one who needs that house. So I'm thinking that homelessness is an impossibility. Houselessness, yes, it seems to be a possibility. But home, you can't be taken from your home and it can't be taken from you. Not the kind of home that we found in Kate anyway. So Kate was one of the, one of the joys in our experience. And then my son, my birth son, ended up in prison. And he spent about six years in the state prison. And during that time, um, his wife, ex-wife, um, called one day and said, I can't take care of our daughter. She was two. Now, our first four kids, all whom are very difficult, had all left home. And we'd celebrated, I think, six months. We bought a little tiny camper. And we thought, yes, we're free. No kids. And I got this call. And she said, I can't handle it if you don't take her. You know, basically, she was going to be homeless, she said, because I'll hurt her. She said, I just can't emotionally take it. So on a two-hour notice, we became parents of a two-year-old. And six, six years later, another child appeared through our son's relationship. Uh, a heroin addict gal had a baby and abandoned him. And we became parents of a two-month-old. So that's why our six kids are all kind of spread out. And that little guy turned out to be the most beautiful little kid we could have had. He had, he played classical piano for about 11 years, sang in a boys choir, and has found a sense of home within him that has just blossomed. So these are the reasons, just a few of them, there are many more, that this, this particular lecture is such a vital, wonderful part of my life, because each and every child we felt had his own home. And by seeing that, the healing started happening. But I need to share a little bit about why, I'm, why I had to come to the, the place where you know, I did with, with all these kids and all this sense of home, because it wasn't always easy for me. Um, I was raised in a dysfunctional home where we'd moved by the time I was uh, 15 around 20 times. And it was all up and down the, the West Coast and Chicago, um, but dad was an alcoholic. and so. And he was abusive, and I was the oldest, so I seemed to take most of the abuse. And it made me kind of a tough kid, because I was defending my younger brother and sister. And so I always had this feeling that all my cousins who came from kind of stable families and had nice houses and all the things that I wished we had were better off. And I, I felt a little bit slighted. And I thought that you know, this, this God that I was hearing about who was up in the sky looking down and kind of making decisions about who was going to go to heaven and who wasn't going to go to heaven and someplace else was not fair. And, and then I was taught Adam and Eve was the story of creation, and that didn't seem fair. You know, and that's a mess, that story. And, and it says, you know, that's the first account of homelessness. They're kicked out of Eden. They don't get along. The, the husband can't trust the wife, and he's a coward. He can't even stand up to the fact that he ate the apple. Apple? There weren't apples. You know, and I was from Washington State, the apple capital of the world. So the whole thing seemed very unfair, and the kids didn't get along. You know, the whole, it's a mess. And this is what I was taught in Sunday school, what little I had. You came from this. This is your heritage. So live with it, basically. Well, I didn't think that was right. And then, oh, and then I'm supposed to love Jesus? That, well, it was told it was like a piece of God that came down and turned into a man. And if I could love him enough, somehow God would think that was wonderful and I'd get to go to heaven. But he was feeding people and he was finding money and you know, fish's mouths and all this. And I wasn't finding any money and I, we often didn't have very good food because we were living sometimes, and we lived in a shack that the roof fell in, and we were living in places that I was embarrassed to bring friends to at different times. And so why would I want God and religion and all this? So I decided I was going to figure this whole thing out on myself, uh, by myself. And that's when I launched out expecting our, my first child at age 16 on my own. How was I going to do it? Well, the only thing I knew how to do was sing. And I think the reason I knew how to sing, as I think back on it, is because we didn't have any money and singing was cheap. 
and my brother and sister and I all started singing harmonies, and we put on shows when anybody would come to our house. So I was pretty good at singing, and I ended up going to San Francisco on my own with my little child and kind of starting out, and I got into this rock group and started my own group, and uh, one thing after another, and we were starting to make some money, and things were, I was friends with Janis Joplin, we sang, you know, in concert together, I drank Southern Comfort backstage with her, and all that stuff, and Jimi Hendrix and I played Fillmore and Avalon, and the Rolling Stones, you know, he spat upon me when we sang together, and he was a wild guy, and still is, how does he keep going, I don't know that guy, you know, so it was kind of, I was starting to make some money, and the album was good, and all this stuff, but I had this inside feeling of being lost, of my home and the destruction and the, the things that had happened in the home. And it just felt like without a sense of home that was spiritual, one that I, I really could depend upon, I, I didn't feel very grounded. And so home for me was the search, that I was really was home and love, kind of a combination of the two that I was really desperate to find. And I was searching in absolutely everything the world had to offer. Because when I look for something, I really look really hard. And I looked into drugs, and I looked into drinking, and I looked into smoking, and I looked into sleeping around, and anything I could think might give me some answers. You know, when people do stuff, bad stuff, whether it's get into pornography or drugs or whatever, they're always, to me, trying to find something to fill up that gap inside that place that they believe somebody took away from them or they never had, that sense of belonging. And that destructive behavior is usually an attempt, an honest attempt, to find something to fill up that hole. And so I often find that these tough kids and the tough ones are really sometimes the most persistent and maybe even the most um, valuable of our citizens because they're not putting up with the mediocrity, but they're really looking hard, trying to find answers. And so that's kind of what I was doing, and what happened, I feel, was a kind of a spiritual intervention. I noticed when I was a little girl, I always thought there has to be more going on. This just doesn't seem like a good life. And maybe you can make it to age 80 or 90, but you start, you know, I remember Noah, my little grandson, you start kind of going downhill. My little grandson, Noah, he's about, he just turned 12, very outspoken. At three years old, my mother's laying out on a lounge up in Lake Chelan, and she's got a lot of freckles. And Noah came up to her and he said, Grandma, you know, you're dying. And Mom, who was in her 80s, said, well, you know, how do you know that, Noah? He said, well, see those brown spots, you know, bananas? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, you know, I'm kind of going through the same thing, thinking this is just one bad trip ending up, and that's how we're all going to kind of, you know, this is not a good experience here. And so I'm trying everything, and I got into these drugs trying to find some answers, and I had this spiritual experience, this intervention. Now, an intervention in the drug world, what happens is when somebody's either doing drugs or, or having a tough time living in society, all the family members, everybody who loves that individual, they write down all the good things they can think about them. And then they surprise him with an official, usually it's a counselor. They all surprise this individual and they, they kind of trap him and they start telling them everything good about them. They pour in love, which is kind of what's been happening in this community and the disaster, pouring in love, because it's so natural to want to pour in a sense of right, well-being, affection, which is what you're doing here tonight. You're pouring into the consciousness of this community affection, love, care. And even if the people aren't sitting here, they feel that, that's a force. And so this intervention can happen in wonderful ways. And it happened to me when I was all alone. It was a spiritual intervention. I was doing some, I was taking LSD, doing some drugs to try to get new ideas to write original music. I thought I was a little DNA package. That when I was born, this is all I got. And to me now, DNA means does not apply. <laughs> I learned something. But at that time, that was it. And I was told, you know, the apple can only fall so far from the tree, and I'm an Adam and Eve 
creation, dad's an alcoholic, dad, you know, so I'm going to be pretty, pretty bad off. So I was going to try to figure out how to survive in that place. Well, I'm home alone, and I took some LSD to write music, and my little boy was there, but he was a little guy, and, and it turned into an overdose experience. And an overdose on drugs. Now, I was trying to get new ideas. Overdose is just, you don't get any new ideas on drugs. They just take all the ideas you have and mess them all up. So it, no good thoughts were coming. It was just taking what I had and turning it upside down, and, and I became very fearful and out of control mentally and, and physically to some degree. And this, I was so panicky, I thought, I, just, I thought about suicide, but I couldn't do that. But I felt like I had no basis and I didn't know where to go. I couldn't do it because I loved my son, and I thought about calling the officials, but I couldn't do that. So I was at the end of my rope, where I felt separated from anything that felt like a home or like love or respect. And I was at that point when I thought, there's an old Bible in the closet, and I ran and I got it, and I sat down on the floor and I held onto the carpet, and I opened this old Bible in panic three times to the same passage, First time, thou shalt not commit adultery, didn't know what adultery was, closed it up, opened it the second time to the same passage, still didn't know what adultery was, closed it, and third time in total panic, opened it to the same passage. And the thing that happened reminds me now of something I heard about an atheist walking along a cliff and he falls, and as he's falling, he grabs a hold of a branch and he's hanging there and his arm, you know, it didn't hurt too bad, so he hung there for a while, and then it started hurting. And he thought, oh boy, I'm gonna pray, and he prayed, is there a God up there? And he didn't hear anything, and the more it hurt, the more his heart opened up. And as his heart opened up and his mind opened up, he said, oh, if there's a God up there, please help me, and he heard the voice, this voice of God that's so amazing when you're suffering. And the voice said, I'm here, let go of the branch and I'll catch you. The man looked up and he said, well, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> Not an option in my case. I'm at that point where I'm just in panic. I open the Bible, the same passage, thou shalt not commit adultery. But the words on the page were darker than the other words. And I thought, this must be a message. I'd never had this experience before. And so I took a huge, huge chance and began to let go of the branch. Now, to me, the branch is anything in our thinking that hangs on to matter. Matter being, but this is the way it's supposed to be, but I lost my most precious home, or I'm no good because Dad abused me. Anything that keeps us locked into uh, not letting go and getting new ideas, which I'll talk about a little more. So I was at this point where I had to let go of poor me, I'm scared, maybe there's no God, I don't trust you, all these branches. And I said, all right, what's adultery to this presence that obviously was talking to me through the Bible? And the idea that came, it filtered through my confusion. It was just all over the place, my thoughts. And I was hanging onto the rug to stay upright. And I was fighting with my feeling that I would, couldn't make it. And through that whole confusion came the words, it's living with one man while you're married to another. And that's what I'd been doing. I'd never gotten a divorce from my first husband. And I didn't care, and I was living with the guy in the group, the, the, one of the singers. And I didn't care so much. To me, it wasn't so important that I had been caught in, in doing something that didn't appro God didn't approve of, because I, I had a list, you know, a long list of things. I was already figuring I wasn't going to heaven, so I wasn't worried about that. But I was impressed to think at that moment that I wasn't alone, that there's actually a consciousness talking to me through this fear that I felt I didn't do anything to deserve um, to be talked to. And it, yet it broke through this fear at this moment when I thought I couldn't make it, and it specifically told me something. It told me what adultery was. So I felt like maybe there was some hope that I could trust this voice. And I said, I, this is my letting go totally of the branch. I said, okay, and I'm still in the fear, even though that, those words came to me, if you'll help me, I'll do anything you tell me to do. And that I met with my whole heart because I was just at the end of what I considered my rope. And when I did that, all this fear and all this feeling of confusion completely stopped. 
And it felt, it reminded me of Lake Chelan in the early morning. It was so calm. And I felt love and I felt home. And I felt a feeling, and I've, I've often, I love that. Was it My Fair Lady? That all I, all I want is a room somewhere. You know that song? You know, that feeling. She just wanted that warm heart, warm hands, you know, and a box of chocolates. And I thought, whoa, this just feels like this is the place I want to live. This was the best, best feeling I'd ever had. And I didn't do anything. Nothing had changed except I had let go of my own branch of fear and doubt and I had trusted and leaned into this presence. And I got up off the floor and that trip was gone. It was completely over. And, and an LSD trip for me at that time could last four to 12 hours. I was experiencing what they call contact high, which is a drug user can walk into a room and somebody else is on drugs and they're instantly as high as that other person. It's such a mental experience. And, and it was gone. And I went to the phone and I called a Christian scientist who was the woman, of the mother of the man I was living with. And I said, this is what happened to me. And she said, I've got a book that'll help you understand love. And that's the home feeling you're having. It's just love. And I'm thinking, wow, whatever this is, this is what I've been looking for. I was looking for it in the drugs. I was looking for it in relationships. I was looking for it all over. And I never felt anything like that. And it healed me. So she brought me this book, and honestly, I, I didn't want religion, because my concept of religion was, no, no, don't do it. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. And it left me with a whole bunch of nots, but no options. So to me, religion was a bunch of restrictions. And so I was a little nervous about a religion. And she said, it'll help you understand the Bible. And I'm thinking, oh, great. Now we got the Bible and thou shalt not, religions and a book. And I didn't like books. I hadn't read books. Because in our lives, we were survivors. And when I went to a new high school, they'd give me a bunch of books. And I would, just, I would be behind. And I, never, I didn't do well. So in that, in that promise, though, I'd said I'd do whatever God told me to do. And, he said, you got to read this. I'm thinking, OK. I made a deal. I opened the book after she left, and it started speaking to my heart. I didn't understand some of the words, because there are big words in that book. But I had a dictionary, and I started looking them up. And what started happening, it was like I was moving home. It was like I was moving into a place that I didn't even know existed before. And I found this passage, I mean, these things in Genesis that were so wonderful. In Genesis 1, there's a different account of creation that really took me out of Genesis 2 and put me in a new place. And I've thought about it as if, if you were adopted at birth, you were adopted by this, this poor family. And they did the best they could, but you didn't have anything, and life was pretty tough. And then at 12 years old, you get a knock on the door, and it's, they say it's the hospital, and they've made a terrible mistake, and they've just realized that you're actually Bill Gates' child. <laughs> I'm like, yes, that would be so good. You would be thinking, oh my gosh, where's the bank? You know? <laughs> you're loved, you're precious, unlimited. And that's how it kind of felt. I read some things, and I've written them. You've gotten one of these sheets. I read things. God saw everything he made from Genesis, and it's very good. I'm thinking, wow, I never heard that before. And God created man in his own image. That's you and me. This is like somebody was giving me a new account, a, literally like a bank account of ideas that mom used to say to me when I was in trouble, Jenny, who do you think you are? And I would just be like, oh, I have no idea who I am. You know, it's your fault, any of the bad stuff. And I, really, I didn't know how to answer that. And that was changing. With each new thing I would read, Pilgrim on earth, thy home is heaven. Stranger, thou art the guest of God. Wow, this is, this is an amazing identity change, if you will. It was just as drastic as if you were adopted by the wrong family, and, and they're not your real parents. And because if, you, if I began to think about myself in a new way, I would begin to act in a new way. And that's what started happening, one thought at a time. But there was more to it, that I couldn't just pretend none of the bad stuff happened. 
what I found was by thinking thoroughly and clearly about my life, instead of just accepting this like blindly, I had to understand what was I doing when I was trying to get stuff out of drugs? What was I trying to get? And I became aware of a new sense of God as not a person in the sky, but as the presence of good, filling all space as the presence of love, which to me was home, as the presence of spiritual qualities, like kindness and tenderness and gentleness and peace and, and abundance. These are qualities that are everywhere in this room. And I thought, I can express joy over here, I can express wonderful joy, or over there, or anywhere I sit or stand, I can express joy, and so can each of you. And how we express it individually is so unique and beautiful, but it's the same joy. And it helped me to begin to be less afraid of people, because I thought, started thinking, well, everybody's true identity comes through in the expression of spiritual qualities. And I remember hearing about an artist at this time who was a, a famous artist who did detail work. And he was asked, where do you get all your patience? And he said, I don't have any more than anyone else. I just use all of mine. I thought, wow, I just need to use some of these qualities that I didn't know were here. And the qualities were like money in a bank. If somebody told you you were Bill Gates' child and that you had an account downtown and it had all the money in it you could possibly want, you wouldn't stay home and think, well, that's nice. Now I'll just go about my business pumping gas or whatever. You would go there, you would show your credentials, you would demand your rights because you knew now who you were. And you would demand that they see, acknowledge, give your, your money to you, and you would go out and spend it. And you would feel very rich. Well, when I began to hear that these spiritual qualities are yours and mine, I thought, wow, well, I need to claim them go to that spiritual bank, claim those qualities, accept them, and then started using them, expressing them. And it was that vivid in my thinking. I read things that gave me the right to do that. Jesus said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There's none good save one, and that is God. God is good. So this account must be really good. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. It doesn't say little. <laughs> I'm, come that they, I'm come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Whoa, this was feeling good. And this was going to be an honest investigation of my rights and your rights, because I couldn't be the only one. I'd be very lonely if I was the only one who had this wonderful source. So I began to think, Okay, now what am I trying to do? Because you can't take alcohol away from the alcoholic. It would be cruel. You can't take drugs away from someone addicted. It would be cruel without replacing them. And I began to replace <coughs> my thoughts of myself as needing alcohol or drugs or other things with understanding the spiritual qualities I was trying to get when I was doing those things like this. When I was doing drugs, what spiritual quality was I really trying to get that would fill me up and make me feel loved and that sense of security? What spiritual quality do you imagine I was trying to get when I did drugs? Harmony? Harmony? Creativity. Creativity? Only two? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Peace. Originality. Joy. Freedom. Something beyond this brain stuff that I thought was pretty limited, my DNA package. So what I did is instead of just ignoring those desires, I wrote those spiritual qualities down on a piece of paper. And I thought, these qualities are like music. Music is all over this room, isn't it? How much music is in this room? Infinite amounts. If you didn't know about radios and you'd never heard, you were a primitive people, you would say there's no music here. But once you knew about radios, you would tune in and hear all this wonderful music. And I began to think of spiritual qualities like music. I thought, well, what was all that bad stuff? Dad's abuse and the, the homeless periods of time and the stuff we went through? It came to me that it was static. 
it was static. It never, it never became part of the spiritual qualities. It was what I didn't know yet about the music. And I wasn't quite tuned in to the spiritual qualities. And when you know what music is and you turn on the radio and it goes, you don't get scared because you know the music's there. And so what do you do? You tune it. And as you tune it, you keep in mind what the music sounds like. And then you tune it until you hear it clearly. So what I did is I realized I had to find out what the music of those spiritual qualities that I was looking for in drugs was really all about. So when I took this list of joy and, and originality, I, I looked those words up in the dictionary. I tuned my thought. And then I looked those words up in science and health in the Bible, and I found Wonderful passages, another one says, as mortals gain more correct views, tune into, of God and man, multitudinous objects of creation, which before were invisible, will become visible. That also includes things like houses, jobs, abundant supply, cars, the things that are objects of thought, really, not stuff but objects of understanding the music of love. And for me, I was going after the ideas because they were going to last. I'm going to walk through life with spiritual qualities wherever I go, but the stuff is going to change. Once you've got that sense of spiritual qualities and the music behind the, the, the things, if you will, the qualities, you can't lose them. So I tuned into the qualities that I was trying to find in drugs, got to know those qualities, looked them up in the dictionary, science and health in the Bible, and then tried to express them in my daily life. Originality, kindness, gentleness, different things. And I did this with every activity that I was doing on the outside that I needed to understand more clearly was a spiritual uh, expression of spiritual qualities. And I've seen some wonderful healings with, when it has to do with relationships in this area, which is another lecture. But there was one young man who was addicted to pornography. And he was ashamed. He was a student of Christian science, and he was trying very hard not to give in to this addiction. But it just seemed so strong. And so what we did, instead of saying, no, no, don't do it, because this is not a no, no, don't do it way of thinking, but rather, you've already got all those qualities you're trying to find in pornography. And we wrote down, we looked at this, this whole way of thinking, and I said to him as we were talking, what spiritual quality are you trying to find when you look at this picture? And we had a hypothetical picture. And he said, well, and it was actually a woman, and he said, well, warmth and tenderness and affection and acceptance and, and maybe strength. And, and we wrote those qualities down, and, I, and we together agreed, well, where are those qualities? And he said, well, they're everywhere. And so we kind of came to the conclusion that lust is saying that it's out there and I don't have it. And that the reality is we all have those qualities, so let's get to know what they really are, claim them ourselves, and start expressing them. So he made this list and he looked these words up and he began to realize he was already complete and he didn't any longer want the pornography because he had all those wonderful spiritual qualities that he thought were outside. And he took that feeling of completeness wherever he went after that. And it was a wonderful healing. So I had to do this with myself, with all the things. And you can do this with anything that looks like it's lost. A house. A house is a place that expresses spiritual qualities, and the spiritual qualities can never be devastated. Spiritual qualities can't be slapped, burnt. They can't slide down a hill. They cannot be lost. The spiritual qualities of home are safety, security, purity, love, affection, tenderness, wholeness, oneness, and you can express those qualities wherever you go. And those qualities, when expressed and acknowledged and recognized as coming from this infinite source of all qualities, have a powerful effect on our human experience. But what I found was thoughts would come at me and they would come at me, no, this isn't true. This isn't going to work. You're too addicted. You're addicted to smoking, for instance. And I found a four-step process that helped me in this how to overcome thoughts that come to us 
that we've lost something or that we're addicted or that something's not good, Genesis 2 instead of Genesis 1. Craig will help me. What I found is thoughts only come to you one at a time. When you see something like this and there's a raging fire and it comes at you, there's devastation. That's called, to me, an aggressive mental, it's coming to my thought, suggestion. And I have a choice of what to do with that thought. Uh, that thought says, you're Genesis 2, life is no good, it's separated from this presence of love. My opportunity at that moment is to go to the bank and claim my right as an expression of Genesis 1, goodness, God's qualities, to feel that goodness either for myself or for my thoughts of my brothers and sisters. So what I do is, it's called four R's. It doesn't go through, does it? <laughs> I thought about that. So <laughs> what I have the right to do is, you can double it if you want to put it on the other one. Okay, wouldn't that be fun? Huh? Then I'd have to be, let's see, how would I have to overcome? <laughs> okay. So I reject. I say no to the thoughts that come to me, the first R. I reject the thought that says that somehow good is missing in this moment. Because God's goodness is everywhere at all times. Then I reverse. If something seems like a sickness or a fear or whatever, find the spiritual qualities that would wipe that thought out. Kind of like the opposite of that static would be the beautiful music. Find the spiritual quality that is the music that would wipe out that specific thought that is not Genesis 1. Then replace. In your thoughts, when you think of a situation, um, know that right in that place right now there's a parallel reality going on a spiritual music if you will that maybe we can't see with our eyes yet but we know is there Jesus said ye shall know the truth and the truth will make you free and the truth is this music and then rejoice don't wait for the picture to change before you say thank you father and that was the example that Jesus gave reject the thought that would separate us from the presence of love Reverse by finding spiritual qualities that are the opposite. Replace, knowing that right there, right now, those qualities are present and rejoice. Now this is more than a nice theory. It actually is a healing power that makes a difference in our everyday physical experience. And my first account of healing of, uh, that happened because of this was when I prayed for somebody else. Happened when my little boy I was just starting to get these ideas that I, I'm, I have dominion, is the word, over this earth. And Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand and, and that it's within. So if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it can't be destroyed. But how do we experience it in practical ways that makes a difference in our everyday lives? Well, there's a way, and this is the process that I found works in healing. I was just new to these ideas and I was letting go of all kinds of branches, this doesn't work, poor me, what'll I do if, all kinds of fears. And I was dropping them and really letting go and trusting and leaning and being a guest of God. And what happened is I woke up one morning, my little, I was, by this time I, the drugs fell away because I had all these qualities that I didn't need the drugs. I quit smoking because I was inhaling these ideas and they were so satisfying. They were way more addictive than matter stuff. And I, I separated from my boyfriend because I found a sense of my own purity that just felt so, so good. And so I was then living alone with my little boy, Robbie. And one morning he woke up and he wasn't breathing right. He had croup. And he'd had that since he was an infant. And it's not a fun thing for a mother. There's no cure for it. Our pediatrician used to give me, you know, say five days and it'll go away. But in the panic of those five days was not fun. So the first thing when he woke up, I thought, oh my gosh, here we go again. And then I remembered that God saw everything he made and it was very good. And that was a new place, a new, new way of thinking. And I thought... Mary Baker Eddy said, you know, in the back of Science and Health, there's a hundred pages of healing from just doing this kind of thinking, uh, opening thought to, to this precious reality. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try this. 
and the fear was coming at me, and it was coming at me. A mother's fear for a child or a father's fear for a child is awful strong. And I turned on the fear, and I looked at it, and I said, no, you are, I rejected it. You are not real. You're static. You're no part of this moment. And then I thought about the spiritual qualities that little Robbie expressed, his purity. You look at a little guy, and they're so beautiful. The children are so innocent, innocent. And I began to think of those spiritual qualities, and they were really peaceful qualities. And then I replaced. I thought, right where Rob is, right at this moment where that breathing seems so labored, there's inspiration. God got there first. There's joy. God got there first. This presence of love has always been right there, and nothing can close my eyes to that very presence that is your love, right loving that child. And then I thank you, Father. And as I did this, this wonderful peace kind of enveloped us, and we felt secure, and we felt safe. And it couldn't have taken more than five minutes. And I looked down, and Rob was asleep, and he was breathing normally, and that was the end of that problem. He didn't have croup anymore. And I thought, wow, this is so simple. You know, it's just really being able to, to let go of that fear and that branch. And so I started doing this, and I began to have other people call me for help, and I began to think that, you know, this is really claiming the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I found that when other people would call and say, I, I'm homeless, was, we had a period of time where we didn't know what we were going to do, where we were going to live. Th there's a solution. Craig was in the military, and he went through some tough things and ended up out of the military with no job, and he was an army chaplain. That, that was, that, that's another lecture. I ended up married an army chaplain, which 40 years we've been married now. And um, that's another story, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> we married opposites. Anyway, I do have my cards up here, which have some of these articles in them that you, you're welcome to turn to my website if you'd like to read some of these. But we were out of the military, didn't know what we were going to do for a job, and, and yet we refused to think that we were unemployed. Employment is the expression of spiritual qualities. You're always employed. I saw you guys all on the job tonight, serving cookies, hugging each other, smiling. You were all employed. I mean, I don't know what you call it, but you're definitely employed expressing God's qualities. And you are rich because he's your employer. And so we refused to accept we were unemployed. And we just kept knowing that right here, right now, we're expressing God's qualities. And it reminds me of a story during the Depression when a man was a farmer who wanted a farmhand and there were no jobs and people had lost their farms and it was a tough time financially. And this one fellow put a little ad up at a post office and, and all kinds of people the next morning, lines of men just wanting this one job. And he thought, you know, what am I going to do? Who, who do I hire? And one after another, they'd owned ranches and farms. and. And finally, one fellow, they were talking, and during the conversation, the man he was interviewing looked over and saw a weed in the grass, and he went over, and he bent down, and he pulled the weed, and he went back to the conversation, and the fellow said, you're hired. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he was going to express those qualities, whether you know he was employed and getting money or not. And I thought, wow, we're employed when we pick up something on the street, when we help our neighbor. We're employed, and expressing God's qualities is a, is a very profitable thing to do. So anyway, so Craig refused to accept an I that he was unemployed. We just expressed spiritual qualities wherever we went. We were feeling grateful. We were reversing any thought that we were going to run out of money. I think we had $500 to our name. And across the country, we went from Texas to California, up through Washington. And every city we came to, we said, OK, Father, is this where you want us to express your qualities? And it would say no, and God would say no, and we'd move on. And we did this for about a month. And um, funds were not abundant. And we got to Washington, and Mom and Dad called and said, a little apartment they owned has come available. Would you like to live in it? And we said, that'd be wonderful. And it did one thing after another, and it was in 74, was it, honey? And there, was, there were no jobs. And yet Craig and my mom, who was an employment agency lady, would call him up and say, you need to get out, and you need to go from place to place and knock on every single door. And Craig just refused to give in. He was just, nope, I'm already employed, and I'm in the presence of all this good, and it's guiding me. Because God's love guides us like a parent. It's a, if we're a guest of God, and God owns everything, 
How would you treat your guest if you owned everything? Boy, you'd have good sheets. <laughs> you know, probably 600 count even. Good things. You would love your guest. You, you, you just wouldn't, you know, you just, it'd be a wonderful thing. So I'm thinking, guests of God, they're really cherished. And, and so Craig refused to think he wasn't a guest of God, and he was just finishing up. He got a, able, because of the military, got to go back to college, and I worked, and we, it just worked out. And then he didn't know where he was going to get his internship. And he was driving from San Francisco to San Rafael, and he went by Mill Valley, and the thought came to him, out of the clear blue, turn in here. And he just turned the car, and you know, he, he was supposed to be coming home after school. And he went into the city manager, and he said, I'm looking for an internship. And the city manager just happened to be there, which is unusual for him to take somebody off the street. And he said, well, did you know that, was it early that, how did that work? It was that morning, he said, I was posting a notice at the school Craig Golden Gate University he'd gone to for an intern, but it hadn't gotten up yet. Nobody'd respond to it. He said, did you see that notice already? Craig said, no, I didn't know there was a notice. And the man said, well, that's amazing. Well, since you're here, I might as well interview you. And then he said, you're hired. And it was like, it just kind of came because this acknowledgement, he went to the bank, if you will, of spiritual qualities. <coughs> And, and it was so beautiful because it's like the kingdom of heaven appeared. And I'm convinced through having relied on this way of thinking for so many years and seeing it heal, not by making people better, but by revealing the music that's already each of our lives. That healing appears naturally because the static is just beliefs. It's a thought that we're separated from this incredible Genesis 1 creation. No one can be separated from their sense of security and safety and home. Every single individual who comes to your thought, you have the right in your own thoughts to say, I can't be made to believe that Mary or Joe or Jane is separated from their loved place. In your thoughts of others, you have the right to see them as God sees them, fully employed, loved, rich, abundantly cared for, and the stock market cannot take away our abundance. It's, there's a higher law. Jesus showed us all these laws were practical. In the Bible, when somebody had to pay their taxes, he said, there's a fish, catch the first fish, opens it, open its mouth, and there's money. Now, we fish. I haven't had that experience. <laughs> but other things have happened. And when people were hungry, he didn't say, go out and toil in the soil and, you know, go plant the corn, and maybe in six months it'll grow. And No, he just uh, pr produced this abundance through his understanding. And I began to think, maybe Jesus wasn't so bad after all. It got a new, and then Mary Baker Eddy helped me. She's my mentor. Mary Baker Eddy, the author of Science and Health, has become my spiritual mentor because she went through a lot of the things I did, and she was homeless, and she overcame it through understanding. She wrote incredible things about the abundance. One of them is, I, I love this story. It's from Mary, we knew, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Healer. That's the name of a book, Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Healer. Page 157, it says there had been no rain in the Concord area throughout November, and rain can never be an enemy. It can never cause something evil. Rain is a blessing, only a blessing, and it cannot cause destruction. Destruction is Genesis 2, rain, Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is filled with abundance, and rain is part of that. So destruction we can treat no way. There is no destruction in the rain that love gives us. And that means no landslides. Right there, right now, is intelligence, which means a gentle rain. Right now, right in that place where that hill is, there's firmness. There are all of God's right qualities. Thank you, Father. So this is another way to apply it in specifics. Anyway, this is one. There had been no rain in the Concord area throughout November. The farmer who delivered Pleasant View's milk told the cook. Now, Pleasant View was the name of Mary Baker Eddy's estate. Concord is where she lived. The farmer who delivered Pleasant View's milk told the cook that his well was empty and his cows were beginning to go dry. When Mrs. Eddy was told about this, she smiled and said, Oh, if he only knew love fills that well. 
The next day when the farmer came, he was overjoyed to tell the cook that that morning he had found his well full of water, and what was amazing to him was that there had been no rain to fill it. Wow, what does that say about our accounts? About our gas tanks, about our budget, about our lives, about our health. But the acknowledgement that love fills all space and letting go of the branch of I'm this age, I was abused, I'm whatever, Genesis 2, allows us to see that love. It's the music. So to me, Craig's job or the full well or anything else that acknowledges this love to whatever degree in our human experience is legitimate evidence that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this is all grand, and it's all more than grand. It's practical. It has to be brought down to the moments that we experience in our everyday lives. If the thought comes to you about yourself or your neighbor, and it's a habitual thought, one that you think over and over again, you can do something about it. In this moment, you have no yesterday. Nobody has a yesterday, but in their thoughts about yesterday. And it's so wonderful to recognize that our thoughts, Mary Baker Eddy says, we can revise and expunge the mortal history. Powerful ideas, because God was actually in that moment when it looked like a bad thing was happening. There was a parallel reality, like music, going on even in the moments of what looked like a disaster. So at all times, under every moment, every circumstance, there's a parallel reality going on. And I find it so precious to recognize that God got there first in those moments and that I don't have to be afraid when it looks like a disaster is facing me. And sometimes in those little details, um, they seem unimportant. But our thoughts about yesterday can kind of crowd in and pretty soon we're carrying burdens that we can let go of and I found a passage that helps me do it. It's in Science and Health on page 494. 494, would you do that for me? Line 13 and it begins in the middle of a sentence but I'm finding it so powerful that I just find I have to share it. I call it my metaphysical eraser. When you think of something in the past that was bad and even your birth, my birth separated me from the infinite nature of life, you can do this. You can go to this, do the next page, because I don't know if they can see that. OK, never mind. You can tell who's the boss. <laughs> um, it says, to all mankind, to all mankind. Take this passage and think about it for five minutes. It's a discipline. Pa separate it all up. To all mankind. And in every hour, divine love supplies all good. I'm going to do it just a moment. To all mankind. That means everyone, everywhere, unborn, born, died. Nope. To all men, all universes, all mankind in every hour. Every one of their 24 hours. Every moment, to all mankind in every hour, divine love. What's a divine piece of cake like? <laughs> really good. Divine love. It wouldn't be divine if it didn't know how to love you. Divine love then supplies. If you're in the military and you're told you're going to be supplied with something, what happens? It gets to you. Supplies. What? All good. Just a teeny little bit? Just enough for today? No, all good. So what I started thinking was, in that moment, revise the history in your thought. Even if it seemed horrendous, revise it. In that moment, there was a parallel reality going on. Open my eyes to see it, Father. Be willing to drop the branch of the memory of those moments in which that bad thing happened and be willing to be lifted to the perspective that the spiritual qualities that are the opposite of that bad thing were in that moment. And to me, that's why thou shall have no other gods before me becomes a possibility. Because then we have that reality. 
And this is detail stuff as well as big stuff. Little thoughts about yourself. Looking in the mirror, I'm sure getting ugly. <laughs> Wait a minute. To all mankind and in every hour, I'm expressing the beauty of soul, the presence of God's love. And I began to love Christ Jesus because that's what his message was all about. And Mary Baker Eddy, bless her for it, gave us, and me particularly, because I had this terrible concept of Jesus, a reason to trust this wonderful messenger. She says in Science and Health that Jesus was the name of a man like Joe or Tom, and it was a common name, and that because of his virgin birth, he didn't have a birth dad, he had a birth mother, but he could see more than you and I because he had a spiritual parentage, father. But we could still see him because he had a birth mother. But he was more in tune to the music, to the spiritual qualities than anybody ever has been. He could see the reality, the, the truth of you and me when we couldn't. And Mrs. Eddy says, Jesus beheld in science the perfect man who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. And he was doing this all over the place. He would see somebody, somebody would say, my daughter died. He'd say, no, she lives, and she'd get up. Somebody said, Lazarus has been dead for four years, and he says, no, and he doesn't see that, and he comes out. Somebody says, we don't have enough food for these 5,000 plus people. He said, no, we've got enough. Express your gratitude, use what you have. Boy, he was doing this all over the place. And, and this presence of God is identified by the word Christ, the Christ. The Christ, the presence and activity of God's qualities. And he saw these so clearly. This is what Mary Baker Eddy showed me, that he got that title, Christ Jesus. And then the neat part is he said, we stand in the same presence as he did. So Jesus became to me like a big brother saying, look, Jenny, this is what God's like. This is where you come from. This is what it's all about. Boy, this guy is really a great expression. No longer fearful. No longer somebody I didn't trust. And I don't have to walk alone because this same Christliness is mine. So I started feeling this, this closeness to Jesus and gratitude for Mrs. Eddy. And I use this in my everyday stuff. And I'll just share one because it's one of my favorites. Um, well, there's two. Craig wants me to share the diamond ring because he likes that one. Um, OK. In your everyday experience, watch your thinking because, boy, can it be tempting to fall into patterns. And those patterns are branches that just don't get you anywhere. And sometimes it gets painful if you hang on for a long time. And so I was, I was in patterns of dishonesty. And I stole all my Christmas one year. And I was just trying to, you know, get stuff. This was before I knew about Christian science. And I was trying to survive. And I was a tough girl. And I used to gesture people if they cut me off in the car and it wasn't a wave. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, this little, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to survive this life on my own. I, w I was standing up to dad when he was drinking. And I was just, you know, he was a big guy. And I got strong and tough. And um, then I needed to learn how to be a guest of God. And a guest doesn't steal. You know, a guest wouldn't steal from a host that lavished them with love. And I was feeling more and more lavished, more and more loved. And at my, I was in this little apartment, and I was in, by myself. And the drugs had fallen away. And I was you know, going through a, I, I wasn't living with guys or anything. And sitting on this sofa, and I, it was furnished. And I reached down in the sofa, and I pulled out a diamond ring. Oh, gosh. I'd never had a diamond ring. It was beautiful. And I put it on, and gosh, I felt so wonderful. This was just wonderful to have a diamond ring. And um, the lady who owned the, I had it for a number of months. You know, you kind of get used to a diamond, and pretty soon it's kind of like part of your finger. <laughs> so anyway, the lady who owned the apartment came to visit. She was really a nice lady, and I really liked her. And we were sitting there on the sofa, I mean on the bed, we are on the edge of the bed, and we were talking, and she looked down at my ring, and she said, oh, where did you get that ring? I had one just like it, and I lost it. It was, came from my first husband, and he would passed on. And I said, old pattern, I said, I've had this for years. <laughs> and I didn't recognize how good honesty felt until I went the other direction, and my conscience came to the surface, and it felt horrible. Honesty felt so much better than the ring. And I had kind of thought the ring was the thing that made me feel special, whereas the honesty had made me special. 
And boy, it was just like, it couldn't have been a minute. I, I did not like that feeling. And I took it off and I said, I'm sorry, it's really yours. And she said, oh, thank you. And she burst into tears and threw her arms around me and she said, you are so honest. I'm like, yes, <laughs> pass the test. Every little detail. And then the last one, and I don't want to keep you too late, but this sense of abundance can't be taken from anyone. And wherever we are, wherever we go, the answers are there because God is in that moment loving you as a guest. And the receptivity is so natural to us. We have one infinite source. We're all in the presence of that love right now and forever. It's not a, it's not a hundred year deal, it's a forever deal according to Christ Jesus and according to the teachings of Christian science. It's a gentle recognition of this fact but it's a forever, forever fact. Well, I'm a kind of a do-it-yourselfer. We learned growing up how to do everything we needed to do because we couldn't afford to do stuff. I cut my hair, everybody's hair in the family. You know, I put in toilets. I do all the things that I need to do. It's getting less now. I'm getting better at being a guest, but <laughs> I'm a guest a lot of people like to have to their homes, let's just say. And I'm, Craig, a couple times he's come home and my girls and I, had this bright idea to remove a wall. And I remember once all the electric, I forgot there were cords, electrical cords in the wall and there's like electricity running and that's all that's left, no wall. And Craig's like, why couldn't you wait? We could have hired somebody. I'm like, oh, I didn't think you'd really want to. And so I, I'm sorry, honey. I've been doing this for years, but I had this bright idea and I try to do it before he gets home because I'll take a little, you know, guff or flack or, and I deserve it. Um, anyway, so um, one day we're on this property and it's big property and it's, it's forever lots of work, but I found some slate and it was big slabs of this slate and it was really thick and I discovered if I hit the side with a hammer it would separate and turn into two and I'd hit it again and I'd have like four. Oh, it was really amazing. I was so excited and I thought I needed a walkway. It was dirt from my house. It was 20 feet to the driveway. So I quickly, and I'm trying to do all of this in a day so Craig doesn't come home and tell me I shouldn't. Anyway, so I made these little forms and I formed this little thing and I put all the slate by the sides and I had it all figured out and all I needed was a concrete. So I'm like, okay, I got in our little Toyota truck and I went to the concrete place and I'd measured it and he said, okay, you need so and so amount. It was almost as big and tall as this table, not quite. <clears throat> and he, he, I, he filled it up, you know, the truck kind of went down and I'm thinking, boy, this is a lot of concrete. And then he put it in and he said, and by the way, you have 15 minutes before it starts to set up. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And so I'm driving back roads as fast as I can to get home. And I got home, put a shovel in, I couldn't even lift it. Not even one shovel. And at first I felt like I was going to faint. And then I thought, because Craig's going to come home and there's going to be this giant lump of concrete and the man's going to be mad at me because I've ruined his machine and all this stuff. But that panic, I did this for our thing with that panic coming at me and I thought, no. I stood up to the fear and it was really, it was a fog. It was really a strong fear and I said, no, this is not my thought. I'm intelligent and I started reversing. I'm filled with right ideas. I'm strong. I have everything I need right here, right now. Thank you, Father. And I'm going, I can do this really fast. I do this a lot. And so I'm really getting, and right when I got to this peaceful place and I had this sense of letting go of the fear and, and I trusted, up drove my teenage son. He was probably 17, 18. And he's this buff guy and he's got three of his buddies and they came to eat. So I said, okay, guys, you can eat. But first, I want to see, you know, all of you guys have to help me because I'd had like seven minutes left or something. And, and we had all these shovels because we're out on the property. And so they're all like, I can do this faster than you, you know. So they're all shoveling, shoveling, shoveling. And, they got, and I'm putting in the stones. And we got right to the end. And it was getting a little firm, but it never hardened. And at the end, it was just perfect. And I'm like, yes, thank you. Even in the concrete, God is in the concrete as well as in me, you know. <laughs> so it was this wonderful expression. And I thought, you know, this is so practical in everyday things, whether it's walking, whether you're facing, you know, homelessness or unemployment. We have the right to stand up to the fear. We have the right to choose the better part. Jesus says we're, he's come that we might have abundant sense of life and that the kingdom of heaven is within us what a promise and what a right way of discovering that we have infinite amounts an abundance of love not only for ourselves 
but to heal and to help our neighbors, which is really what you're all here about. So we have the opportunity as a community, we have the opportunity, whether we're from Oregon or California, to wrap our thoughts around those who seem to be suffering and know that God got there first. That right there, there are practical solutions, beautiful music, filling the lives, the minds, and the hearts of each and every one of us. And there's absolutely no place, no disaster, that cannot be lifted like a fog or like static to reveal the music. And it says, finally, to all mankind and in every hour, to all mankind, to your neighbors, to those on TV, to those in the war, to the political parties, to all mankind, and in every hour, divine love supplies all good. Thank you. I have to, um, this is being videotaped and I'm supposed to tell you that so you're all going to be on TV. No. <laughs> but we do have it being videotaped and I think it's going to be available at the local reading room, this lecture, for two months. And um, I believe there are copies of Science and Health if you're new to these ideas. Again, I have some articles on my website if you'd like to read them. And if you're, if you're new to these ideas, there are some people here. If you th heard something you really wanted to know more about, there are people here who will mentor you, who will talk with you, exchange phone numbers, and you'll find them <coughs> overhanging around the door. Just ask, is there someone I can talk to? So you're not going to be left high and dry. If you need some more ideas, there's, there's an abundance of wonderful love in this community. So thank you all for being so kind. Thank you.